we go down and search deeper was the realization that Zimbabwe is under siege. We are under capture. But because we've got a myriad of challenges and problems that we're facing as a nation, we tend to get emotional and we don't look at the bigger picture. Every night before I sleep, I still see pictures of Libya then and Libya now. And being the person that I've been, who's always been fighting for a better and just Zimbabwe, for every Zimbabwean, I've taken time to research and find out how we came to where we are right now as a country. And it is really heartbreaking that we indeed do have a third hand that has been operating within our civic space, within our, our journalists, within our political parties. This third hand has divided and destroyed all political parties in Zimbabwe, divided and destroyed every institution in Zimbabwe, because everything in Zimbabwe has to fail for their agenda to work out. So I will start reading my presentation. Since the 17 November 2017 Operation Restore Order that ushered in the Second Republic, there's been a general relaxation of the freedoms of expression. A number of dialogue platforms have been created as a way of building a culture of dialogue among citizens. The relaxation of the freedoms of expression, coupled with the growing use of social media, has been seen by the country's enemies as a loophole to mobilize citizens into an illegal regime change agenda and activities. Why I'm saying this is Zimbabwe is a constitutional democracy. And we, we, we have all been fighting for constitutionalism to be a reality in Zimbabwe. But in the process where we are fighting for constitutionalism to become a reality, some of us are involved in unconstitutional activities to dethrone a sitting government. Armed with skills gained from the Center of Applied Nonviolent Actions and Strategies, Canvas, an international organization based in Belgrade, Serbia, whose track record is littered with success stories of bringing down governments in several countries. Activists in Zimbabwe are unrelenting in piling pressure on the government of Zimbabwe, creating dilemma scenarios where there is core normative leverage through public sympathy. Canvas leaders who led the Otpo revolution in Serbia that brought down the dictator Slobodan Milosevic and worked with activists in Egypt, Libya, Syria, etc., in the Arab Spring, and their latest project was in Sudan. In short, we are under attack as a nation. They are tirelessly working to bring down one of the most entrenched governments that is hated by the United States of America for its radical stance in empowering its citizens. OTPO was funded by the United States International Republic Institution, IRI that is also funding some activist groups in Zimbabwe alongside the National Endowment for Democracy and other smaller U.S. embassy grants, as well as organizations like George Soros, OSISA, among others. I would advise all of you to go and research who George Soros is after this media symposium. Pursuant to the regime change agenda, the United States has trained over 200 activists from Zimbabwe through its Young African Leadership Initiative Program, YALI. And most of these leaders are deployed into organizations to influence a neo-colonialism agenda. Zimbabwe has been a target of the United States since the land reform program and the US scaled up funding for the civic society space. Since 2001, millions of dollars have been channeled into the regime change project through CSOs and NGOs with some Zimbabweans having been recruited to be the U.S. foreign policy gatekeepers and Central Intelligence Agency moles into the agenda. This program saw several regime change proponents working at the USAID as political affairs officers. These include Depros Muchena, Jacob Mafume, Otto Saki, Washington Katema, and others who literally propped up numerous regime change civic society groups, funded friends organizations that were supportive to the regime change agenda. And anyone who was not in their list of cliques was not being considered for funding, regardless of the brilliant ideas they had. The CIA capture of the Zimbabwe civic spaceship 
led CSO directors to generate numerous gigabytes of negative information about Zimbabwe to get money from foreign donors in their project proposal templates. The problem statement must be extremely adverse and alarmist, supported by empirical evidence, which is often fake, to substantiate and justify the request for funding. And these adverse statements go into the CIA reports database and are used not only to justify funding, but to justify the maintenance of illegal sanctions against Zimbabwe. The dangling of funds by the US, UK, and EU saw the proliferation of CSOs, some who were not registered, yet receive large sums of money, which often goes into personal use by directors. Examples, Promise Mkwananzi's Tachamuka, Ivan Mawarire's This Flag Movement, that are not accountable to anyone, yet they demand accountability from the government. The majority of the regime change organizations did not, registered under, did not register under the PVO Act, but registered at the Registrar of Deeds as Trusts and have serious corporate governance issues that are ignored by donors because they are politically correct according to their agenda. Most of these organizations have serious corporate governance issues and corruption that saw Sydney Chisiz Yedes, Gordon Moyers Blawaya Agenda, Amnesty International Zimbabwe, Zim Rights, Election Resource Center, Combined Arare Residents Association, and Crisis Coalition, among others, falling into massive corruption scandals, some of them even collapsing. The proliferation of NGOs, CSOs pushing for the regime change agenda, secret trainings by Canvas, the now defunct CIA's Freedom House project that was a veteran CIA agent, Carl Beck, among others, on how to bring down governments the strategic movement of the regime changed proponents into strategic po positions in, in international organizations such as Amnesty International Southern Africa, currently led by Jeprosim Chena, the Open Initiative for Southern Africa, OSISA, led by Siposami Malunga, and funded by the imperialist George Soros, the movement of Dewama Finger, from Crisis Coalition into the Human Rights Watch, Arnold Tsunga, the founding director of Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights, into the Sadak lawyers' body, among others, created a serious international relations war zone for Zimbabwe and stifled the government's capacity to engage. These organizations influence international perception about a country, and the, re and the regime change proponents are strategically positioned to influence the international community against Zimbabwe. They are concerted and are relating efforts to demonize Zimbabwe backed by a legion of diaspora-based fake asylum seekers who want the Zimbabwe to become a failed state so as to justify their asylum status, have been vehement in attacking Zimbabwe, funding instability and sabotage activity being carried out by activists at home, such as the fake attacks of Patson Zamara, who burnt his own wreckage master Demio and scooped several thousands of dollars as donations for having survived an attack by the state. The local activists are bent on generating fake news that are alarming, sensational, and disturbing with an objective of causing public alarm, panic, and despondency using social media and making financial gains in return from, na from naive donors. The state has been put into a dilemma on several occasions by activists with the most recent ones being August 1, 2018, which my sister Abigail will unpack later on. That had been pre-planned in May 2018 as a strategy of defending the presidential vote at Canvas trainings in Cape Town, South Africa, and Livingstone, Zambia, as well as the January 14 to 16, 29 violent, spontaneous protests preceding well-timed series of fake abductions that are aimed at battering the country's image and ensuring that no investor comes to invest in Zimbabwe and that sanctions are tightened against the government of Zimbabwe until citizens revolt and overthrow their own government, like what happened in Libya. Please note, the Magombe fake abductions were planned and executed after Zim rights had invited the UN Special Rapporteur to assess Zimbabwe human rights situation. The UN High Commissioner for Human Rights dispatched the Togolese National at the invitation of Okema Chisa and Company. 
This was meant to thwart the anti-sanctions diplomatic score that had been scored by the government of Zimbabwe at SADC and AU platforms. Well, Nelson Chamisa was lobbying a well would lobby a whirlwind at Peter Snipe. The impending 31 July revolt by citizens will play into the strategy of the US of instigating the fall of the ZANU-PF government, replace it with a technocratic neoliberal national transitional authority whose proponents are Dr. Ibo Mandaza, Tendai Biti, Jonathan Umoyo, etc., etc. The NTA is a US-imposed idea that will see Americans pour millions of dollars into Zimbabwe for the resuscitation of the economy, provided the NTA reverses some policies that are nationalistic, such as land reform, and liberalize the economy to allow their companies to freely loot Zimbabwe's natural resources. This strategy emanates from the Harry Kissinger plan of the US dominance and looting foreign policy. The NTA proposal seeks to suspend democracy by suspending elections for a period of seven years, focus on rebuilding the economy through reversing ZANU-PF nationalistic and populist policies to allow multinational corporations to invest in Zimbabwe, create jobs and loot strategic minerals like uranium, lithium, gold, diamonds, natural gas and agriculture land. The time frame is anticipated to enable handlers to destroy the liberation movement from within such that next time there are elections, ZANU-PF would have dissipated with the recent release of estimated $1 million for activists in Zimbabwe to execute the Sudan-style revolution in Zimbabwe and according to Popovic's 50 crucial point strategies, buying, bribing, some key people in the security sector, especially targeting middle and junior officers, is one of the discrete actions to slowly influence the security and result in the security system going on mutiny like what happened in Sudan. As such fanning dis divisions and perceived divisions in the security establishment, creating conspiracy theories, I think we are hearing plenty of these every day, to create mistrust among the heads of the security becomes crucial followed by the buying of loyalty from some senior members using large sums of money and other offers. The G40 factor has created such grounds for infiltrating the security establishment and breaking the backbone of the regime. The security sector in Zimbabwe is currently at its weakest, as some former members sell secrets to the opposition and some have become strategists in the MDCA, while some elements remaining within are operating clandestinely, undermining the Second Republic, sabotaging problem, programs and collaborating with the opposition or carrying out extreme activities that create backlash on the government, scoring goals for the regime change team. And please note, this infiltration is not only in ZANU-PF, it is also in the MDC. It is all, also in most political formations. That is why we've realized that there is no political party that has been able to stand for a couple of years right now, because there's a lot of money that is being used to cause divisions within political parties. The game is played in the public perception management arena, where the aim is to destroy public confidence on the current leadership through twisting information and government announcements, creating digital images, doctoring videos, creating gra graffiti, generating fake news, which is the tragedy of Zimbabwe, denigrating the leadership and making them laughing stock, thus making citizens rowdy and ungovernable. Popovic teaches that activism must be exciting. This gives activists enough adrenaline and energy to keep them going. It must be full of humor. The ongoing avalanche of social media and formal media onslaught of the president, the finance minister, and other prominent government ministers is to create anarchy through destroying public confidence of the leadership. The second role of media activism is to demonize the country, create alarm at international level, fake news, stage manage abductions, fake rape stories, fake state brutality stories, to gain international sympathy and condemnation resulting in the isolation of Zimbabwe. The ongoing onslaught on alleged corruption driven by the likes of um, Shinge Munyeza, Apo Chingono and company is part of the strategy of fomenting an uprising and using the corruption mantra to justify the uprising, yet the same characters have cases of corruption. 
In particular, Dr. Munyeza destroyed many lives in the hospitality sector in Victoria Falls. Practical mobilization for action, which the MDCA and its allies are currently executing, involves training the activists, brainwashing them, as David Coulter was quoted at an NEC meeting stating that radicalize the youths. Radical youths are being selected and being moved to secret places for training. And in the past week, they were in Mashingo. That is the research that we did in our own personal capacities. And these radicalized youth are to lead the protest by blocking roads, committing arson, and causing the rest of the citizens to join the protest by default. While the action is happening, the Civic Society Coordination Mechanism is running a backup program. The activists are trained by CSO leaders and facilitated by organizations under the guise of prayers and nonviolent action, sometimes held outside the country, like the team that had flown, flown to Maldives. The coordinated efforts of OSISA, USAID, EU, IRI, NED, TRACE, CIVICAS, etc., funding organizations that in turn set up a mechanism where vetted and approved organizations are responsible for various activities. Some provide services, some provide food, some provide medical services, others provide legal assistance, others do mobilization while others run the rapid response advocacy mechanism that feeds back to the funders, and these include local and regional organizations, such as Zim Rights, NGO Forum, DHR, CSU, ZPP, etc. And they feed information and reports to Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch. They always tag or copy US Embassy, and people like David Coulter send reports to the US Congress and the Secretary for Africa Affairs. Activists are short of backup support like legal representation, medical treatment, protection, while they're in the field and they're sometimes promised asylum in the UK, US, while others are promised money and scholarship and even housing stands because the MDCA is in charge of local authorities. So in short, what I'm saying here is, I've walked this road before as an activist. And there comes a time when you say enough is enough. We have to protect the future of this country. We have to protect our children. Because after all is said and done, there are some people are pocketing the money, whilst others are being sent into the streets to go and get beaten up, and nothing comes their way. Some will die, and they'll lose their families, and what has happened? Corruption is a cancer that is affecting every single person in Zimbabwe, which is a national issue which should not be politicized, and which we should not allow for an intervention lest we destroy our own future and the future of generations to come in Zimbabwe. I thank you.